She advocates against the death penalty. She writes about politics, freedom of speech, and cats. She's Kirsten Han. Hi, Kirsten. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. So I think we'll just get right into the discussion proper. It's that you care a lot about freedom of speech and you write a lot mm-hmm. about you know, human rights. But some people say that this unbridled form of freedom of speech, you know, this rights-based approach is not suitable for a Singaporean or even an Asian context. I understand you would disagree, but what if you stepped into their shoes? What, where do you think they're coming from? I think there is a, a sense that, you know, kind of harmony in society is very fragile and that, you know, we, uh, there's this sense that as Asians, we are more communitarian people. So this, this idea that, you know, it's, it's worthwhile to kind of subsume your in, individual rights and free expression to preserve harmony. Mm. And I mean, it's, it's a very familiar and intuitive sort of thing for, I think, a lot of families, because, you know, like, everybody has that experience where, like, you're at the dinner table, and then your dad or your grandma say something, and you're just like, mm. okay, just don't say anything, because we just need to eat this dinner, and we don't want to ruin the dinner, I don't want to be a person ruining the dinner. And so I think that's a very kind of familiar sense to us. And I feel like some people have tried to apply that to society as a whole. Um, And I can see that, but I think, you know, when we're talking about something that's bigger than just your family dinner, when we're talking about democracy, when we're talking about society and politics, I don't think that is good for us in the long run. Mm -hmm. And I think there's also this kind of, yeah. I mean, there's this mistaken idea that people are asking for unbridled freedom of speech as if there will be absolutely no limits but I think a lot of freedom of expression advocates actually aren't saying that there should be unbridled freedom of speech there is discussions that you know hate speech and things that incite violence and incite harm should not be allowed but then where do you draw the line though where do you draw the line when we're talking about the societal level you know because we see that in in Hong Kong for example the protests have really gotten out of hand and you say that in Singapore and I quote um that there is, to an extent, a willingness or this ability to um, get their voices heard if they want to uh, and make their feelings known at the ballot box. So mm-hmm. why do you think there's a space that there needs to be more discourse in Singapore? Because people already know, you know what they, they, they already have the space to say what they want to say at the ballot box. I mean, I think it's, it's very reductive to, to see the ballot box as the only time that people in in a society can have a say because then essentially it means that you have this one opinion every five years and then you're chained to it for the rest of time and you know even if the the party you voted in does not fulfill promises even if they break promises even if they're acting in ways that you don't approve of the idea that oh you already had your say at the ballot box actually precludes people from having a say any other time but then you see like yeah But some would also argue that, you know, not just at the ballot box, maybe the idea of just the entire democratic process right now in Singapore is already has enough space, right? That there is enough kind of, there's your reach, there's your MCI, there's feedback channels where you can send in your comments. Um, There's the forum letter. You can always write to the forum letter on Straits Times. So why do you think there needs to be even more discourse, bearing in mind that if we allow the disturbances of peace to take place at a societal level, things could get out of hand. I think firstly, it's it's very slippery slope to like, there'll be a disturbance of peace and then things will get out of hand. I think we, you know, actually, you know, if we we are a society that doesn't know how to deal with conflict, it's more likely that things get out of hand than a society that's more mature and understands how to deal with conflict. And I think, you know, things like REACH and like government portals and the Straits Times Forum, uh, they are outlets, but they are also mediated outlets. So, for example, a straight sign forum editor chooses what they will publish. And there have been letters that, you know, can't get published. Um, there have been letters where the writers have said that, oh, it was edited and actually the meaning was changed. Um, then for, like, reach portals, we there's not a lot of transparency about how the feedback is processed. So you give feedback and then the government puts out its its conclusions and it's not clear how the feedback was processed. So I think, you know, there, there can also be a lot more organic spaces for people. 
And I think a lot of times when people say like, oh, we already have enough space, um, we're also not listening to, to marginalized voices that don't have the space. So like where a lot of times talking about preserving the peace um, means that marginalized voices that don't, don't fall into the mainstream actually don't get to speak because an example? you know yeah so for example minority voices right so like when uh, Indian and Malay Singaporeans uh, want to talk about racism often it's like oh you know we cannot talk about racism because it's so sensitive you know it might disturb the peace uh, how can Pretty Please and Subhash do a video like that you know it'll get people upset and then like things will go out of hand but then that essentially means that we are telling minority Singaporeans to shut up for for peace and I, I don't think that's real harmony. I offer a different um, perspective. So I think what you said just now was that there needs to be a, a place for Singaporeans to figure out how to have conflict and then therefore have mm-hmm. dialogue. But what if they want that dialogue to not be so stuck or, or be filled with expletives? They, they say, maybe the, the main gripe against you know, the, the rap video, for example, was that there were expletives. So what if the, the mm. idea here is we can talk about race, but without the expletives? What if that's their perspective? So we want conflict, we want discourse, but we want a little bit of mediation, a little bit of boundaries around it. I mean, that can be part of the discussion, but then the problem was that this was not a discussion. This was people called the police, right? And then they got, you know, warnings and and then they had to take down the video. And so it wasn't even a discussion about that. But then at the same time, you know, I think the expletives are part of this learning how to deal with conflict. Not everybody is going to express themselves in ways that you are comfortable with. You know, not everybody is going to employ the same tone. Not everybody has the same articulation of language. You know, some people might not speak English as well, and then they might not express themselves as well. They might sound more kind of um, strident. They might sound more stuck than you're comfortable with. And I think learning to sit with that discomfort is a really important lesson. So maybe like it would be better if we could, instead of going, oh, why do they use expletives? To think about like what, what made them so angry in the first place that this, this sort of expression was how they decided to express themselves. You know, the, the injustice is actually more important than whether people are comfortable hearing expletives. Which do you think is more important? The idea that I'm getting my message across in a way that's most authentic to myself, or I'm getting the message across in a way that is going to reach my audience effectively? How do you do that? I I think there has to be, you know, there has to be both and a range of responses. So it's, you know, like we can't assume that, oh, um, Priti and Subash have to, tackle the argument by themselves and they are the only ones to tackle the argument and this is the only video that anyone will see, right? They will express themselves the way they express themselves and there are other people who are doing anti-racism work who might choose different targets. So like in this in this movement, people play different roles and, you know, some will reach out to older Singaporeans, some reach out to younger Singaporeans, they have different audiences, they have different bases and that's how we move forward together, right? Rather than expecting that one thing targets everybody. And also like, you know, while some anti-racist um, activists might do work that doesn't involve expletives, might seem like a kinder, more measured approach than a rap video, um, the rap video is also important to exist because it helps normalize this range of responses. It helps to get us used to the fact that people have a range of responses and we don't need to freak out when one response is like different from what we expect. But what about, you know, the other work? Because what I see is that there is a lot of people I know, younger, woke activists. They're very good at sounding the gong. They write very well. They can rally the people. People like their posts. Things are reacting. But at the same time, I also see that there's a gap you know, that there are a lot of social service organizations that find it very hard to retain volunteers over time because the, the larger structure mm-hmm. of the society is still that we want to go to work, we want to get our jobs done, we want to move on with life, right? So when there's an uptick in concerns like the migrant workers crisis, we all want to pitch in. But when there's mm-hmm. a, you know, slowdown, people just kind of move out of the game and, and these NGOs are struggling. They don't have hands and legs to do what they need to do. Where, why do you think this is get? Do you think it's because youth find activism and this sounding the gong, this dialogue sexy, and then the going down and delivering food is not? I mean, there are definitely people for whom that's true, right? Like, it, definitely there are people who will find it easy to 
to write on Facebook, but it's too tiring to go and like haul boxes or do direct services. And I think in every society, there are people who are like that. But, um, you know, I think I think we also have is, to do you do, think yeah. that there is a big proportion of people in Singapore right now? Do you think that we're the younger people, younger activists choosing to do the former than, than the hauling of boxes? Um, so I don't see, you know, I, I know the young people that I know, I don't know how representative they are, but um, there is a lot of uh, kind of motivation to do more. So like they, they speak on Facebook and social media because they feel like that's the first step. And then there's a lot of motivation to do more. I've definitely seen a lot of young people then go on to do like volunteering work. They do their internships, they do their research, they do projects. Um, a lot are, are then later when they graduate, particularly, um, caught up in work and they basically have so much work that they can't do anymore. So for example, um, I co-founded uh, an anti-death penalty campaign with, uh, at the time I was 21 and my two co-founders were 18 doing their A-levels. And we did a lot and then now they are both um, graduated, fully qualified lawyers. They don't have enough hours in the day to do as much as we used to do. Um, a lot of young people find that when they graduate, they don't have enough hours in the day. Um, some are worried that these volunteer things that they do will affect their jobs later because it might be seen as too political, it might be seen as too activist. Uh, their parents are worried, they are concerned about their own jobs. And so, so that I think is another issue. And then of course there are people who are like, yeah, it's just get lazy and you know it it becomes not so pressing it becomes so much easier to to get caught up in your own work and i think that kind of happens everywhere the challenge is how to to get enough of a core that will stick with you even mm. when like other people kind of come mm. and go it's good that people are even sharing articles about this people are talking about this this is in everyone's minds at, at the start mm. awareness is the key but going out to volunteer and continue doing that uh that must come later but having that first step is important. Is that right? Yeah, I think it's a bit of both. Like uh, the discussion is definitely good. So like 10 years ago, there was not even this level of discussion about migrant workers, right? Which also mm. made it difficult for NGOs to do advocacy work because mm. people weren't even talking about it. The mainstream media didn't want to cover it. But now with more people talking about it, the mainstream media has to cover it. And, you know, there has been much better coverage of migrant workers than 10 years ago. So yeah. the, this sort of moving the needle is important. Yeah. Um, the volunteer work is also important, but I feel like at the same time, like we can't have it the other way also, right? Like if everybody just went to volunteer, but nobody spoke about um, systemic issues, then that's that's not moving the needle either. You know, it's really nice to run a soup kitchen, but if nobody will talk about poverty and mm. injustice, that's that's an issue also. So we do need this both side. Mm, I see. Thank you for sharing. I think that's definitely an interesting perspective, and people don't often think about it. Is that you know, apart from going to the soup kitchen today, I go there and I and I know that I did something. Going online to talk about you know food security right on my way, you know, uh, on the MRT train right back is also going to be part of the process, right? Thinking and reflecting yeah. about it. So now that we are close to the end of the interview, I have one last question for you. Is mm -hmm. that, you know, you, talk, you spend a lot of time talking about this and clearly you're not just one of those people, um, you know, sounding the gong. Not, not saying that that's a bad thing. That's also mm -hmm. a first step. Um, but you also bear a lot of repercussions and consequences for doing it. So why do you do it? Um... I find it meaningful for myself. So like on a personal level, I find it meaningful and rewarding. Um, I, I like the idea that doing this, I'm hopefully also creating space for other people to also do this. Um, if, you know, if, if I'm making it seem possible. Yeah. But there are a lot of people who won't want to do that. You know, there are a lot of people who just kind of uh, go on, do it on the side, not, not be a journalist, you know, volunteer, write a few articles here and there. But, you dedicated your life to it. So there's something very, very powerful and, you know, deep down, um, a motivation that takes away everything else that drives you. So what is it? Um, I, yeah, it's really hard to describe in words. I think I just, yeah, you know, like there are definitely times when I'm tired and I'm like, why am I even doing this? But I can't actually imagine doing anything else really like that, that I feel would, would be as meaningful. I've, I've tried to temp in like full-time jobs and by like 
day seven, I'm already like, uh, uh, the one, <laughs> you know, okay, so I like, it. I think, yeah, I think it's, I, I like the variety. I like that I'm being able to speak to so many people and I like that there is, you know, I might not have money, but I never doubt that it's meaningful work and that there is purpose to the work. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kirsten. It was a great yeah, thank time. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Thank you.